Now, I'm going to ask you a question. And uh, if, you, if, if, you, know the, if you, you know the answer, don't say it, because I want to feel like I'm really smart this morning with what I'm about to tell you, right? Who's ever heard of hyponatremia? Anyone ever heard of hyponatremia? Nobody. A couple of you have. Okay, good, but you didn't say nothing. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. It's really good. Hyponatremia, here's what it is. It's a condition that's brought on by drinking too much water. Did you know that? Did you know you can drink too much water and it becomes not good for you? That's right. You can, you can literally die from drinking too much water. Um, about, I can't remember how many years ago now, we, we moved from, Bris, we, from India back to Brisbane, Brisbane to Ballina, and before we were pastoring in Ballina, we were running a YWAM training school for a few years called a School of Evangelism. We would get students flying in from all around the world, and we had this young guy came in from New Zealand, and I remember it was the, towards the back end of the school, a couple of weeks to go, and I got a phone call saying, Alan, you've got to get to the hospital. Um, this guy is in the hospital. And so I, I went to the hospital, and here he is, and, and, and he was unrestrainable. He was, like, fighting. There were four of us trying to hold him down so the doctors could actually strap him in and, and do whatever it is medically they needed to do with him and so on. And it was, it, it was like a, a scene out of a movie. I didn't know what, what, what's happened to this guy. I mean, this one minute you're telling people about Jesus, the next minute you're thrashing about like you've got, you know, stuff going on. And, and, and it turns out that what happened was he, he decided to just drink too much water. And he just sculled and sculled and sculled over the course of 48 hours that much water that it had an impact on his brain and his body and everything like this. And he ended up with this uh, condition. You can drink too much water. Who would have known? Do you know when water comes into your body, how many of you know it also has to go out? Do you know that? It actually has to leave you. When, when that water flows into you, it has to flow out of you. That's healthy and normal. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the four normal, natural ways that water flows out of your body. Anyone know that? I'm going to tell you just in case you don't. I don't want this story to be half finished. So we get water into our bodies, but it's got to leave our body. And, and the four main ways it leaves. Here's a biology lesson. Who came to church for a biology lesson today? You did. Awesome. Great. I'm going to give you a bio. You'll be happy when you leave. The rest of you will be like, what was that about? That's okay. Stick with me. So the four main ways that we leave, uh, water leaves our body, number one is through urination. I never, ever thought I'd get to use that word in a sermon. <laughs> but I just did. So it leaves our body through urination. So our kidneys use water to filter toxins out of the body. But when the kidney has used as much as it needs, it gets rid of the rest through urination. The second way that the body gets rid of water is through stools. I know. I'm ticking a whole bunch of bucket list things off today. I said those two words in a sermon. Awesome. That's so good. I got away with it. You can say that if it's in a sermon. If you say it outside of it, it's like, that's gross. But hey, there's a reason. So uh, healthy, healthy fecal matter consists of 75% water. You don't want to know this, but I'm telling you anyway. Consists of 75% water and 25% solid matter. Once the small intestine's absorbed enough water to send throughout the body, it'll pass the water along to the large intestine. When water reaches the large intestine, it'll be com it'll, will combine with solid matter to soften the stool and aid digestion. Praise God. Praise God, it means you can eat carrots and they can come out and not hurt you. The third way that we lose uh, water is through breathing. Who knew that? Breathing. Yep. The majority of the water you drink is absorbed into your bloodstream. Absorption occurs after the water passes through the stomach into the small intestine. The small intestine is around 20 feet long. It's the organ primarily responsible for water absorption through its walls and into the bloodstream. From here, water will travel to cells across the body, providing them with the hydration to perform daily functions efficiently. And the fourth way that we lose water, and everyone would probably know this one, would be sweating. Exactly right, through sweating. So sweating is a natural way that the body regulates its temperature. It's also what I was doing when I told you the first two ways that you lose water in your body. You might not have noticed. but If you've got a Bible there, turn with me to John chapter 7, hey? Hey? It's not in the top four, sorry. Are you the biology teacher here or me? I don't think you were ever a biology teacher, Rod. You came over here on a ship, remember that? I know people like you. John chapter 7, if you've got a Bible there, a collection of ancient documents that we call the Bible, can you turn with me to John chapter 7? Verse 37 to 39, here's what it says. It says, on the last and greatest day of the festival... Now, the festival we're talking about is, is a Jewish festival. They had these big festivals that they celebrated every year. This one was the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles was there to uh, celebrate the, the bringing in of the harvest. 
So they were an agrarian society and they planted and so on. So it would celebrate the bringing in of the harvest, but it was also to commemorate them coming out of Egypt, their journey out of Egypt. There were seven, I think, major festivals. Three of them uh, combined this idea of celebrating and remembering their journey as they came out of Egypt. And this is one of those festivals where Jesus is at. It says, on the last and greatest day of the festival. So the festival itself went for, for eight days. About seven to eight days, uh, and I'm, I'll, I'll tell you what happened on seven of those days. This is the last and the greatest. So this is the eighth day, on the last day. Kind of takes my mind back to the prophecy of Joel that in the last days, he says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. You'll, you'll, you'll have dreams and visions and so on. There'll be this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I wonder whether somewhere in John's mind as he's writing this, he's actually thinking of that prophecy as well. But he says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. In the Greek, it literally means that they will flow from his belly, from the innermost part of your being. He says that living water will flow from you. And then in verse 39, he says, by this he meant the Spirit. So, so Jesus says, if you're thirsty, come and drink. But what he's really talking about is he's not talking about water. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And John says, he meant the Spirit who those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus was not just talking about natural water. He was actually talking about his Spirit. He's saying, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. Now, now, just to give you a little bit of background on what all the audience had seen for seven days up until that last and great day. During this feast, one of the, 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 the uh, rituals that would take place is that the priests would get a, a, a water jug and they would go to the pool of Siloam and they would fill it up with water. And then they would walk from there with the jug with a procession of people. And they would go through and there'd be uh, chauffeurs sounding and different things going on. And they would carry the water to the altar and they would empty the water at the base of the altar. So I want you to imagine that on day one, they're getting this water and they're walking along and everyone's watching it and the water gets poured out at the base of the altar. On day number two, the priest fills the jug, carries the water, walks over, pours it out at the base of the altar. He does it on day three. He does it on day four. He does it on day five and day six and day seven. And on day eight, Jesus stands up and using this imagery as a background, says, if anyone thirsts, he says, come to me, come to me. And then he says, out of your belly will flow rivers. In other words, if you're thirsty, come to me. What does that mean? It means I'm going to, if you're thirsty, I'm going to put something in you so that you're not thirsting anymore. What happens when we're thirsty? We drink what? Water. We put fluid in us and it hydrates us and so on. But how many of you know that you can't put too much in you? You've got to also regulate that and get a bit out, don't you? And Jesus is talking here not just about water, but it says he's talking about the Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And so for seven days, they would see this pouring out, this filling and this pouring out. Now, in the mind of the people that were watching this procession, here's what was going on. When, when the priest would fill the water jug, they would follow along and there would be kinds of ceremony and different things going on. When the water was poured out, in the minds of those watching and those there, they saw the pouring out of the water as an offering being given to God. The pouring out was an offering saying, thank you, Lord, for the grain and everything you've given us for the last 12 months. But it was also a petition to say, we need more. So we're pouring this out, but we need you to give us more. We're thanking you for what we've had, but we're asking you for more. This is what's going on in the background here when Jesus stands up and says, if anyone thirsts, come to me. There's this water procession going on. And here's the thing. He says, out of your belly. Is going to flow rivers of living water. In other words, when you receive the Spirit, he says things are going to happen that weren't happening before you received the Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit, when you believe in me and you come to me, things are going to happen that weren't happening before you came to me and before you believed in me. Life is going to be different. Life is going to be different. There's going to be something in you that comes out. So the pouring out of the water on the altar was seen by the people as an offering to God. It wasn't the, the collecting, it wasn't the filling of the jug, but the pouring out of the jug was what they saw as the offering. So collecting the water was not the offering, but pouring it out was what they considered to be the offering. And I wonder whether Jesus is saying that if you come to me, uh, all you are thirsty, he says, I'm going to give you my spirit, 
But what I want you to do is whatever I'm putting in you, I want you to pour it back out to me as an offering. What I'm doing in your life, I want you to pour that back out. What I'm putting in you, I want you as a believer to start to pour that back out of your life. What I'm giving to you, I want you to get out as well. Because I can't just keep filling you and 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 blessing 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 you and pouring in and pouring in and pouring in and pouring in and pouring in. That's not what this Christian life is about. God, gimme, 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 gimme. God, I want more. Lord, I need more. I need some more. God, speak again. Give me another word. God, give me another this. Give me another that. It's the pouring out of what God's put in that the crowd considered to be the offering. And I think that God wants us to pour ourselves out in the same way. We can't just keep... How many believers are like my friend in the natural? He just got so much water and so much in him. And he took, it was all about getting, getting and consuming and consuming and consuming. But if we don't let it out, we end up just as useless spiritually as my friend did in the natural. If we don't allow the Spirit of God to flow back out of us, if we don't have an attitude to, to, to contribute, not just to consume, to give, not just to get, to pour ourselves out, not just to be poured into, we can end up spiritually just as useless as what my friend ended up in the natural because it becomes all simply about us. Paul said this in Philippians 2.17. Paul said this about his service to the body of Christ, but also his service to the world. Paul went out and preached the gospel like Bailey's going to do, like Eric is going to do. Went and took the, the good news of Jesus, the death, the burial, the resurrection, out to the world. And, it, and, and, and Paul describes his pouring out this way. He says, even if I am being poured out like a drink offering, on the sacrifice of service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. He called his service, like I'm being poured out like a drink offering. In other words, what's gone into me, it's being poured back out. It's an offering to God. I'm pouring, being poured back out. In 2 Timothy 4, 6, he says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. It's the things that we pour back out that God has put into us when we give back out to, to, other, uh, to the body of Christ, when we give back out to the world around us, when we allow God to flow through us, not just to meet our need, but uses us to meet the needs of others. It's not just about getting things to me, it's about getting things through me so that I can become a blessing, so that I can shine a light, so I can do the things and make the difference down here with the life that God has given me. How many of you know that a lot of Christ followers are a lot like that student we had on the SOE. We go from conference to conference to conference looking for another drink. I just want to get another drink. There's a big conference. I want to go to another one, get another uh, drink, drink, pour, 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 God. Give me more, give me more. We go from book to book to book to book. Just what for? Just to get in, to get in, to get in, to drink, to drink, to drink. We go from podcast to podcast. Give me, give me, give me, give me. We chase prophets around. All oh, the prophets here, the prophets over there, they're all going to chase the prophets. Give me another word, Lord. Give me another word. Give me another word. Give me, give me, give me, give me. We go from preacher to preacher. We go from church to church. We go, well, you lay your hands on me. Now will you lay your hands? Now will you lay your hands? Will you? It's just all about give, 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 give. We end up being believers who are more passionate about being filled up than we are about being poured out. Yet Jesus said, here's what's going to happen. One day, thirsty people are going to come to me. And I'm going to give them my spirit. And out of their belly, out of their innermost being, is going to flow the Spirit. The Spirit that I put in you, I'm going to pour that Spirit out of you. Are, are, are we people that, want, that, that, that live to be poured into, or do we have a heart to want to be poured out of? Do we have a heart just to be poured into, or do we have a heart to be a channel for God to pour through us and into the world around us and the people around us? See, one of the marks of a renewed mind, I knew we'd never get away from this, one of the marks of a renewed mind is that we move from being consumers to contributors, from getters to givers, from storers to pourers. And we start pouring ourselves out. So what about you? Are you a storer? Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give or are you a pourer? Lord, how can I be a blessing to somebody else, Lord? God, how can I make your name great? God, how can I give to that person? How can I serve that person? How can I meet a need? Are we walking around looking to be poured or are we just wanting to store? I love Paul's image of being poured out. If you go back to John 7 and the water pouring ceremony, the water was deliberately poured out in specific places. It wasn't like they filled up the water and then they just ran along and just chucked it anywhere. There was an actual purpose and a place that it was designed to be poured out. Isn't that great? 
So, 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 so it's almost like God puts things into us, but then it's not like we just flippantly go and throw, no, no, I'll put it in you, but there's a place. There's a, there's, there's a need, there's a, there's a reason, there's, a, there's, there's, there's an opportunity, there's a place that I'm calling you to serve, there's a place that I'm calling you to pour, there's a need that I'm pouring into you to meet that specific need and so on. So it's not like we just run around flippantly. Uh, I, I, I know people that uh, are over the years, great Christians with great hearts, who've just wanted to serve God and be a blessing. And they have basically given of their, 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 they give their finances to the point where they literally have nothing. And then they, and they sit back and wonder, well, well, God, you said that you would meet all my needs. But, you know, God says, yeah, but you've got a, a brain too. I, you needed a brain, so I gave you one of those. And, 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 and I want you to, to be wise and, 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 and so on as well. And people that just run around meeting every need and serving, got a gift of service and a heart to serve, and they serve themselves stupid to the point where they crash and burn because they've neglected their family. Or they, and it's just, see, the thing is here that when the water's poured out in that ceremony, it was poured out at a specific place for a specific reason. And while I believe God wants us to pour ourselves out, I believe that there's a, there's a way. There's a way that we effectively and healthily allow ourselves to be poured back out. Paul uses this phrase when talking about his life being poured out. He uses this phrase, I was led by the Spirit. He says, I was led by the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 to 18, Paul says this. He says, I say, walk by the Spirit. And you're not gratified the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh, they're in conflict. The flesh and the spirit, are, they're enemies. They don't like each other. They don't get on really well. They're arguing all the time. They're like two little kids at home that just trying to dominate for attention and want mum and dad and it's all got to be about me. No, it's about me. No, it's about me. They're fighting. They're contending with one another so that you don't do whatever you want. And verse 18, it says, but if you are led by the spirit, not under law. Paul uses this terminology. He says, led by the spirit. Have you ever stopped and thought, what does that actually mean? Because when Paul wrote this, guess what? He meant something. He didn't just write it and go, that'll be a really entertaining thing for people to read one day. It'll be a really entertaining thing for people to ponder on. He said, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm writing about what's actually happening and what we're currently doing. I'm writing about life as we know it. I'm writing about life as hopefully people down the track will know it as well. Romans 8, 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. What does it mean? Led by the Spirit. Luke chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. It seems to me every time it talks about led by the Spirit, it literally means led by the Spirit. That I'm here and I'm thinking about what am I going to do, where am I going to, and there's something leading me in front going, hey, this is the way, walk in it. And so I'm following that thing, I'm being led by something. And what he's saying is that this thing called the Holy Spirit that Jesus said, I won't leave you as orphans, I'll send you. Somehow there's a connection there, whether I can work it out or whatever, there's a connection between this spirit that Jesus said I'm going to give and where I'm going to go in life and where God wants to take me. There's a connection point there. There's a connection point there. He says, my spirit will lead you. Uh, if you read Acts chapter 16 through to Acts chapter 20, you'll see literally that the, the disciples are going this way to preach the gospel. It says the spirit blocked them, forbade them, stopped them. And then they went this way and the spirit stopped them. Then they had a dream and the Holy Spirit said, go this way. There's this, this uh, intentionality, there's this reality to being led by the spirit. It's not just a nice thing we say, oh, I'm led by the spirit. It's actually real. It's something that these guys believed in. It's something that for the first 30 years of the early church, we see Jesus' followers actually being led by the Spirit. They actually believed that this Spirit that Jesus said, I'm going to send to you, was a living, real, real person, a reality. A reality in their life, not just something that's ethereal, not just something that, you know, uh, God, Jesus said to comfort them, oh, I'll be with you. And they're like, no, you won't, because you're going to heaven. We're not stupid. And he said, I know you're not stupid. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send my spirit and you're going to know. You're going to know. You're going to know that I haven't left you. You're going to know that the spirit is with you. But here's the thing. Being led by the spirit is more than simply doing what the Bible prescribes. Every one of those things that Paul writes about led by the spirit, led by the spirit, led by the spirit. Guess what? When he said that to them and it, it, that message came to them when they were sitting in their little houses, they didn't have a Bible as we have it today. You ever think about that? The stuff that's being written about in the New Testament. When he talks about being led by the Spirit, he's not saying, today we go led by the Spirit means just do what the Bible says. Well, that's not what they heard because they didn't have a Bible. Isn't that weird? They didn't have a Bible. So, 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 so when we say led by the Spirit, I just mean just do what the Bible says, it does mean that, but it must mean something more than that because these people didn't have a New Testament. Yet Paul's saying we're being led by the Spirit. 
And I went into the New Testament and I can't find a verse anywhere that says thou shalt take the gospel to Macedonia, but somehow Paul ended up over there and did it. I can't find a verse in there that said to Peter and John, in, 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 you know, you're going to find a, a, a crippled man begging at a temple and I want you to go and pray for him and he's going to jump up and God's going to get glory in Acts chapter uh, 3, whatever it is. I, I don't find a but somehow they did it. Somehow they, some, somehow they got there. Somehow they got there. I wonder, I wonder today whether we have moved slightly too far away because of bad experiences and because of hyper-Pentecostalism and because of hyper-faith and all that. We, 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 we've, we've kind of moved so far away from any sense of expectation or reality of the Holy Spirit in our life or His ability, the Spirit's ability to lead and to guide and to speak and all those wonderful things that Jesus said he would do when he came. I wonder whether we've moved just a little bit too far away from that. The Spirit always aligns himself with the Word of God, but we need to understand the Holy Spirit is not just the Word of God. He can't have been. He can't have been. Otherwise, Jesus would have said, I will not leave you as orphans. I'm going to give you a book. It's going to be a good one, full of really good stuff. I want you to read it. Memorize it. Follow it. There was more to it than that. And it's important to note that Jesus said it would be the spirit that would flow out of us and through us from our innermost beings. I, 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 I wonder sometimes today whether we've replaced the spirit with human intellect. Because if you don't have the reality and the power of the spirit, well, what do you do? You either get on your knees and you cry out to God and you say, Lord, God, what, what, what's, what's going on here, Father? We... If you are the same, we're singing songs today about being the same yesterday, today, and forever. If that stuff's real, then God, the God I read about in the New Testament, the God that Paul wrote about, that Peter wrote about, the God that, 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 that James writes about, the God of the New Testament, that God, if he is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever, but I'm not uh, 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 seeing or feeling or sensing or experiencing a God like that, my Christianity feels more like just a great philosophy and a great way of life. If I'm not experiencing that, I've got one of two options. I either get on my knees or I get before the Lord and say, God, search me, know me, see if there's anything going on in here, God, because, Lord, I want you flowing through me like you flew through these guys. God, I want you to use me. I want to make a difference. There are still people who need to hear about Jesus in my community. And you spoke to these people and you led them and guided them. There are still sick people that need to be healed and medical science can't do it. I'd love to lay these hands on them, Lord, and see them healed by your power. There are still people that have demonic things going on in their life, psychology just psychiatrists can't help them because it's not a natural thing not a chemical imbalance it's demonic Lord I want to be able to walk up to those things with authority say get out of that person I want that Lord so God it's not happening Father speak to me what's happening here or I replace it with pure intellect and I just get very intellectual about my faith now I'm the first one to say to you you need to have an intellectual faith my wife will tell you that we need, to have a, we need to have reasons. We need to understand what our faith is about and know how to communicate our faith and we need to be able to, to be smart faith is not done Faith is smart, but we don't want to get so far inside our heads and so far inside that intellectual rabbit trail that we forget God is alive. Our God is alive. Our God is alive. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, Paul writes this to the Corinthians. He says that, uh, and so it was with me. He says, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence of human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Think about that. Paul said, I came to you, I was weak, I was fearful, I was even trembling. But the point is this, he came anyway, didn't he? He did it anyway. He did it anyway. He didn't sit back and go, God, give me a goose bump and make me feel good. And No, no, I know this is right, Lord. And he came and he did it. And he says this, I came to you in weakness and fear and great trembling. Verse 4, my message and my preaching were not. If anyone could have used wise and persuasive words, Paul was a very highly intelligent dude. He was a highly intelligent guy, trained by some of the smartest religious minds of his day. He knew his stuff. He knew his stuff. He says, but when I came to you, I didn't come with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. That tells me something about the Spirit. There's a demonstration aspect to the Holy Spirit. My wife went to a, a party recently, a, a, what do you call that thing, a thermomix party. And, and when she went to a thermomix party, they didn't just sit down and get out a manual and read about what a thermomix can do. That's not what you demonstrate, that's not a demonstration, that's a book reading. 
And so what happened was they went there and the lady did the Thermomix thing and they baked cakes and created chickens out of nothing and they painted the house and, 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 and built a car like these things can do everything. Thermomixes, they're unreal apparently. And, and the, but what they did is they showed, they demonstrated you. The people were there, not just being read in a book about here's what a thermomix does. They saw what the thermomix did. It was demonstrated to them. And Paul says this. He says, I don't want to come to you with wise and persuasive words. I want to come with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And then he says in the last verse there, is we got it up there, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Our faith rests on something other than just great intellectual knowledge. It rests on God's power. It rests on the reality that if if God's power is not real, if our faith does not rest in God's power, if God is just a philosophy, can I encourage you? Don't sing those songs that say, my God is alive. Don't sing that line. Just go blank on it. Because if he's alive, that means something. If God is active today, that means something. And Paul says, I don't want your faith to rest on the wisdom of men. You know why? Because I know you human beings. And I know that with great intelligence, I can sucker some people in here. But here's the thing. If I can get you intellectually to follow Jesus, because I've been very intelligent in how I presented it, and it's purely an intellectual house of cards that your faith is resting on, one day someone's going to come along with a lot more intelligence and a lot more smarts, and they're going to pull the bottom card out, and the whole thing's going to fall. But when we encounter the power of God, the reality of God, Paul says, once you encounter the Holy Spirit, he says, no one's going to talk you out of that. No one's going to talk you out of that. When that Holy Spirit comes into your world and he begins to demonstrate the gifts of the Spirit begin to flow through you. Before you know it, things are happening. You're praying for the sick and they're being healed. You're looking at someone and the Lord gives you a word of encouragement and you're walking up going, look, I don't know you from a bar or so. I, I, I was in a, a line. I, I, when, when we lived in India years ago, I went one night uh, with a mate of mine to go and watch the movie. I'm, I'm only going to confess this once. I'll never say it again. I went to watch the movie Titanic with another man. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. I went to watch the movie Titanic with this friend of mine and I'm standing in line. And as we're standing in line in India to buy the tickets, there's this Indian guy from the Indian army standing in front of me. And uh, he turns around to me, we get into this conversation. And without even thinking about it, out of my belly began to flow this river of living water. And I looked at him, well, I looked up here, he's quite big. And I'm looking at this guy and I said, mate, you're married, aren't you? And he said, yeah, I am. And I said, you've got two kids, haven't you? He said, yes. I said, they're little kids, aren't they? He said, yes, they are. By this stage, his jaw's on the ground. And I said, one's a little boy and one's a little girl, aren't they? And he went, yeah. I just turned around, bought my ticket and walked in. I didn't even realize what was going on. And then when I sat down, I thought, oh, gosh, God, I had him right there. You wanted me to tell him that you love him and that you're there for him. And, you know, it just out of your belly begins to flow rivers of living water. And God wants to flow out of his people. He doesn't just want us to live in our heads. Because how many, how many of you in here now, let's, let's be honest. Let's be honest. Now, I, I, I go to, uh, uh, I, I teach on what's called schools of evangelism in YWAM. And I ask every student at the very start, then the schools can range from 12 kids to, to 80 kids. And I'll say, put your hand in the air. If the thought of telling somebody about Jesus absolutely freaks you out, and it's, you know, you, your heart is you want to do it, but it freaks you out because you're thinking, I don't know enough and I don't, can't answer. All. And I say, put your hand up in the room. And I'll tell you now, 95% of the hands will go in the air. 95% of the hands will go in the air. And here's why. Because if you think that reaching the world for Jesus, if you think doing things for God, making a difference for God, is all going to come out of your head, then most of us are in trouble. Right? Most of us are, probably not you, you're a very intelligent man. I've had some conversations with, 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 with you. And Rod, Rodney as well, very intelligent man. And there's lots of other intelligent people here. But let me tell you something. I don't care how intelligent you are, you can't cure cancer. I don't care how intelligent you are, you can't, if you can't lay your hands on the sick, that there's no point where God goes, I'm looking for a certain IQ before I begin to use you. He's not doing that. One of my favorite stories is in, 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 in Acts, it uh, might be chapter 4, I haven't got the verse there, but it, it says that, that uh, I think it was Peter and John, it was just after the, the guy was healed. And they dragged them before the religious leaders and so on, and they were threatening them. You can't preach in the name of Jesus. You've got to stop this because everybody's starting to go nuts for Jesus because they're seeing that you guys have got something we don't as religious leaders, and they're going to all follow after you, and they're blaming us for killing Jesus. You've got to back up. Stop this. 
And they said, you decide whether it's better to, 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 in the eyes of God to obey man or obey God. But it says this, it says when they were criticising them, it says that they stopped though and they looked at them and they realised that these guys were uneducated, untrained men, but they realised that they had been with Jesus. They were uneducated, untrained men. But what did they have in their favour? They had the Holy Spirit. They might not have known a lot of stuff, but they had the Holy Spirit. They might not have had a lot of answers to a lot of questions, but they had the Holy Spirit. That word in the Greek, uh, where it says uneducated and untrained men, those two words, agramatos idiotis, literally the Greek words, means unlearned, unlettered idiot. It's literally what it means. They looked at them and said, compared to us, you are uneducated, illiterate idiots, literally illiterate idiots. Idiots. But these illiterate idiots had just healed a man that had been at a temple begging for money and had jumped up and was rejoicing and people were excited about God because of these illiterate idiots. I'm so glad these illiterate idiots got out of their head and realised that there's more to my faith than just whether I've memorised enough Bible verses or not. I've got the Holy Spirit inside of me. Jesus said you will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. And I fear today because I think, you know what, if we're not careful, we're slowly getting, the church is getting inside its own head. And we're starting to go down these intellectual pathways and there's nothing wrong with it. But don't sacrifice the reality and the power of the Holy Spirit for the sake of intellect. Don't do it. Don't do it. The younger generation... They're going off to universities. And you know what happens? I've read the stats on this, and it's, it's, it's amazing. They're the first tri- uh, not trimester, that's when you're pregnant. Um, what, what do they call it? A semester. Semester. You know? Their first trimester. The first semester when they go off to college. There's some university lecturer, and I've heard this from university lecturers, that some of them do it deliberately. They make it their mission to destroy your faith in the first semester. It's their job. Before anything else, they just want to get Jesus out of you. How do they do that? Well, they just get up in here. Just get up in here. Before you know it, they're contacting you or writing you letters going, ah, can you? I was just told this. Grew up in church and I was told this, but this guy's just in three classes just completely ripped that house of cards down. What, What have you got? I think, well, I might not be able to intellectually go where some of these guys go, but hey, let me pray for you. Let's go and see if the sick can be healed in Jesus' name. Let's go and see if, 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 if the power of Jesus still inhabits the earth today. Let's see if God is still using his people. Let's see if God is still flowing through his people. Because, yeah, intellectually, yeah, there, there's, you know, up and down. Now, I can talk you out of faith. I can talk you back into faith. Someone else can talk you out. But, but it's not all about that. None of that is bad. Don't walk away saying, Alan says we should all be dummies. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is this, that when Paul talks about being led by the Spirit, he's actually talking about a very real uh, uh, thing. Not just some idea out there in the sky. He's talking, when he says, I'm being led by the Spirit, he says the children of God are those who are led by the Spirit. When Jesus was led by the Spirit. When it says in Acts 16 to 20, they were led by the Spirit. When we read about dreams and visions, when we read about healings and miracles, when we read Joel's prophecy, in the last days I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh and there will be dreams and visions and prophecies. We're talking about demonstrations of something tangible and real. Something tangible and real. And you know what? I think as a church, as a church, we just need to be careful that we don't sacrifice all of that on the altar of intellect. Because it, let me tell you something. It's easier to justify in my own life why God, uh, why Lord... Um, so when I was younger, I'll wrap up. We're running out of time. When I was younger, earlier in my faith, and I wasn't so smart, I, 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 could, I could spend days standing here telling you about the healings, signs, wonders, and miracles that I got to see when I was too dumb to realize that I was probably praying wrong and you know, putting the wrong hand on people and I had my tongue on the wrong side of my mouth when I did it. I didn't know. What I did know is that I had this encounter with Jesus at 19. He came and he transformed and he changed my life. And what I did believe was if, 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 if God was dead, he wouldn't be transforming anybody today because dead people can't change nothing. Right? Okay? But God is alive and God came and he transformed my life. And so the God that transformed my life, God changed my life before I'd memorized a single Bible verse. 
God transformed and changed my life before I realized that I didn't know a lot of stuff in here. God transformed and changed my life before I realized that I, I, I wasn't meant to be capable or qualified or whatever. God did something in my life, and then when I just stepped out of my childlike faith and started trusting God and putting myself in positions and, and listening and being led and, and backing, and, 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 and all of a sudden I started just seeing amazing miracles and things taking place, not just out there, but even in my own life, just following the promptings of God. Alan, write your mother a letter and tell her that you're sorry that you treated her so poorly when... And, you know, and I'm fighting that going, no, God, you tell her to write me a letter because I was good and it was all her fault and God's going, no, Alan, you do it. I'm leading you to do this. You go and say, sorry, you repent. You go and give that money back to that person you stole from. Alan, you do all this stuff and so on. But as you be led by the Spirit and start doing it, this living, I couldn't find a verse in there that told me to do any of that. Go and give 50 bucks back. I never found a verse in the Bible that said, go and marry Jackie. I was led by the Spirit. To, but the, the, God said, no, this is, this is the one. Go there. This whole idea of being led by a living God, being led by a very real Holy Spirit. See, I think this is, the, I'll finish with this because we're running out of time, I'll forget that. Here's the reality. Here's the reality. If Christianity is just about gathering on a Sunday, hearing a couple of guys sing a song, some dude stand up front and give you a great speech, having a, I was going to say a nice cup of coffee, but if you're here, having an average cup of coffee. having a nice chat and then going home. And they just eke in the rest of our week out, hoping we can make it back. So that we can come back in again and hear another guy talk and hear a couple of songs. And if that is all that Christianity is, it's no wonder that we're not turning the world upside down anymore. We need to reclaim. And if, you, if you're not ready to reclaim, you need to rethink about the person of the Holy Spirit. Go back. Go to John chapter 14 through to 16. Underline or get a piece of paper and write down everything that Jesus said the Spirit would do. Do. In other words, demonstrate. Active, real, tangible. Go to the book of Acts, start at the beginning and read right through. And everywhere you see the Spirit guiding, directing. The Spirit said, set apart Saul and Barnabas to the work to which I've called them to. The Spirit gives this vision to Peter while he's on a roof and says, don't you call unclean what I call clean. And then he goes down and he felt by the Spirit to go with these guys. And before you know it, you and I get a chance to be grafted in to the kingdom of God. You take the Holy Spirit out of the New Testament. We don't have anything. And you take the Holy Spirit out of the church today. You just have a Lions Club meeting. That's all we got. Amen. I'm hungry for more. I hope you are too. I hope you are too. I feel like God's calling us to something more. I, 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 I want to finish this off next week and talk a little bit more practically about being led by the Spirit. But what I want to encourage you this week is I want to encourage you this week to do something. In the cling and the clutter and the clatter of your life, will you try to find some spaces, just small spaces, even if it's when you wake up first thing in the morning, to just quiet yourself. Try to get rid of the distractions, the noise, chuck your phone to the other end of the house, get rid of that thing, and, and just sit and just listen. Listen to that still small voice on the inside of you. Listen to see if there's not a prompting or a nudging or a, a question being asked or an answer being given. Just, just check and see what is it that the Holy Spirit may be saying to you. And then if you're bold enough and confident enough, why don't you take a wild radical step of faith? and Why don't you actually start to walk into that thing? Why don't you start to accept that invitation? Why don't you start to move in that direction? And let's just see. Let's just see what it is that the Holy Spirit might want to do in our lives, but also through our lives. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Why don't we stand on and pray? And then we can all go and have an ordinary cup of coffee together. <laughs> Hallelujah, Lord. It's not ordinary coffee. It's a gift from you, God, and we thank you for that, God. Uh, Lord, God, I, I want to pray for each of us in this place this morning, Lord. And Father, we, we are grateful, God, to you. We are grateful for the death, burial, the resurrection of Jesus. We are grateful for that moment in human history, God. Father, we, there, there are, uh, uh, I'm sure, people in this room who have, uh, Lord, we've bowed our knee, we've accepted that. Father, we are running with you. We are, uh, God, have received that promise, the gift of your spirit, Lord. I'm sure there are other people here, God, who are just questioning it. God, there are people here that are checking it out. There are people at home watching who are thinking about it. They're still trying to work it all out. <laughs> Lord, we are all at different stages of our journey. But 
I pray, God, would you take, in, over these next seven days, I pray for every person in this room, everyone watching online, would you take each of us individually one step deeper into the water with you? Just take us one step deeper into the water with you. Lord, I pray, Father, for those that will go home and pick up John 14 to 16 and read Acts, Lord, I pray you would highlight to them, Lord, the reality and the activity of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, that you would also show them that there is no use-by date anywhere in the New Testament that says these things shouldn't and can't happen again. Father, place within our hearts a hunger for the reality and the presence of God. That, Lord, when we, when we gather together, Lord, it wouldn't just be to sing and to hear, but it would be to listen to the Spirit, to experience the Holy Spirit in our midst, in our presence corporately. But, Father, when we walk out of this room as well, Lord, that we would walk out there knowing that we're not going by ourselves, we have the Holy Spirit with us, Lord. Father, you have placed within us gifts. You have placed within us power. God, there are, there are fruit of the Spirit in us that is being cultivated, that is transforming and changing us into your image. God, I pray with every circumstance and situation that we face, no matter how big, how small, no matter how, how hard the, the, the roadblock may be to get through, Father, I pray that those in this room that are your people, they would know, they would know something would rise on the inside and they would go, hang on a second, this is not just me, I've got the Holy Spirit as well. And that we would lean in and we would listen, Father, to what you are saying to us, God. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Bless you guys.